Good morning, all. This is Corey Lambertson with Whitmix Corporation. Uh, today, we are going to cover Temporaries 101. Uh, so we're pretty excited for today to talk about the temporary game inside of 3Shape. Uh, just a, a quick housekeeping reminder to everybody, this webinar is being recorded and is also accessible uh, at a later date. And there, it does qualify for CE credits. Uh, once again, my name is Corey Lambertson. I'm with Whitmix Corporation. I am the product uh, support supervisor here at Whitmix. And we also have Bryce Hiller and a special guest, Brandon Smith from 3Shape. So we're pretty excited to have him on. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, uh, who you are and what we're going to be doing today. Cool. Uh, I'll go first. Um, my name is Bryce. Most of you know me. Uh, if you don't, I, I work uh, I work with with Corey here, um, and I'm a, a technical support specialist. Uh, my specialty is primarily 3Shape and 3D printing. And um, uh, yeah, Brandon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon Smith. I am an academy trainer with 3Shape. Um, I also did uh, used to work at Whitmix, uh, kind of in the same position that uh, Bryce and Corey are in. So. Um, Hello, if there's some of you out there that uh, I used to talk to on the phone some. So, um, yeah, that's that's a little bit about me. Very cool. So today we're going to cover scanning and designing of temporaries. We're going to be using the three shape dental system software and we're going to be using a three shape desktop scanner. Brandy, can you tell us a little bit about what version of the software you're using today and also what version of a scanner you'll be highlighting today? Yeah, so um, the software that I'm running is the new uh, Dental System 2020 software. Um, the release on this is should be within the next month. Um, now, COVID-19 could change that a little bit depending on who's able to actually still work on the software behind the scenes. Uh, but the last I heard, uh, May 14th was the target date. Um, it may get pushed back a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, also, the scanner that I'm using is the E3 scanner here. Um, so I'll be doing all the, the scanning on that. Um, it has a full arch scan speed of about 22 seconds. Um, so it is is fairly quick. Um, and there's a long line of these scanners, the E1 through E4. And then you also have the D2000 that we still uh, sell. Very cool. And all those scanners are compatible with the workflow that we're going to be doing today, correct? Correct. Awesome. Now, you, you touched on the, the COVID-19. Uh, how have you guys been doing? I mean, how you personally, I, I, I see it, it looks like you're working from home. Uh, how are you hanging in there? And, and uh, are, you, are you able to stay busy? And, you know, I, I guess... Uh, you know, just give us some, uh, I guess, give us some insight on how you are today. Um, so, yeah, we're, we are all working from home at the moment. Um, I have been home now for six weeks. Um, we have been doing a series of webinars, um, virtual classrooms, um, doing some one-on-one -on -one training still virtually. And we've also been doing um, some Q&A sessions um, where... Um, we have a whole website. Um, if you guys want to check it out, it's 3shape.com forward slash academy NA. Um, there are links on there where you can schedule to join webinars, live, live uh, or virtual classrooms, um, and all the other things. Um, so it's a, it's a really good website. Um, everything is free right now. We've uh, taken away the pricing for um, while the quarantine's in effect to encourage users to get out there and get educated on the software. Um, so it, awesome. it's a really cool website. Um, you should check it out. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So for everybody that missed that, uh, the, the web address, what was that one more time, Brandon? It's 3 shapecom slash Academy NA, standing right, very, for North America. Very cool. And then uh, we'll go ahead and get started here about two seconds just to let everybody know if you have any questions at any time at any moment please write them in we're going to go ahead and address them as they as they uh as they come through so um oh 
a uh, person actually said, with the exception of Brandon Smith, would the other two reps state their names? So yes, my name is Corey Lambertson with Whitmix Corporation. I'm the product support supervisor. And I'm Bryce, uh, Bryce Hiller with Whitmix. And uh, I'm a tech support specialist here at Whitmix. Very good. So we got the first question out of the way. Brandon, the floor is yours. All right, awesome. Um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and start setting up my case. Um, so if you're not familiar with the dental manager software, this is kind of what it looks like here. Um, all of your cases will go into the main white area. Um, and to create a new case, you have a few options as to do that. Up here at the top left, um, you can see that we have the little page icon that will create a new case. You can also right click and go to new, or you can do the control plus N on the keyboard. That's the hot key to create a new case. So there's a few options here. So I'm just gonna select new here. And this is my order form. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and name it. So I'm gonna do virtual temporaries. And then um, I am going to select the tooth. So um, I do have my arch here that I'm gonna be scanning. So I'm just gonna select uh, number six here. Um, and then to uh, set up the case for what I'm gonna be scanning, um, I'm going to come up here to anatomy and I'm going to go all the way over almost to the very end here and drop down this little uh, menu here that says temporary diagnostic wax up and snap on smiles. And then in there, I'm going to go to temporary crown. And then I need to make sure that I come over to my plus symbol here and drop this down and choose the material that I'm going to use. So um, I did go ahead and add in the Dentco material. Um, I'm not sure what material you guys are actually going to be using, so I'm just going to go ahead and use that. We will be using the Dentco material uh, for this demonstration. So this is just part one today. We're going to have part two on Wednesday, which is actually talking about the material and the 3D printing aspect of it. We'll highlight printing it on the Verbuild 3D printer from Whitmix and then also the Asiga uh, Max 3D printer, and then on Friday, we're going to talk about how you can actually uh, some different finishing techniques for the temporary material. Now, I saw on that uh, drop down for the temporaries, we're doing a uh, the uh, uh, when you go to the actual types, we're doing a shell temporary for this design, correct? Yes, what yep, if it'll we're... be a shell temporary? Um, you'll also want to make sure, you know, there are different types of materials in here. So if you're 3D printing, you'll want a material that uses like a printing process as the, the manufacturing process down here. Um, so I actually didn't set, quite set these up properly because um, it still says it's a milling process. Um, so the difference is going to be um, if you choose a milling process, it's going to apply drill compensation, which will give you some over milling in areas that are thinner than a certain drill radius. Usually about, if if the mill, if the burr is a one millimeter burr, it'll be a half millimeter radius. Um, so it'll apply that. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch this over to model material so that we do a printed process with no over milling. Very cool. Um, um, and then the next thing that you, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Um, the next thing that you can do is um, if you're not going to prep the model at all, you'll need some way to place the virtual temporary. So if you come down here to appliance, you can select a positioning guide. So that will give you an index to place this in the patient's mouth because the doctor will be prepping these teeth and then relining the inside of the temporary to place it. Um, if they adjust it down a lot more than what you do in your shell design, it's going to fit really loose on there. So you're not, you're going to have a hard time positioning it. So rather than having to print a model of it with it in place and then do a suck down, you can actually just add a positioning guide to it. So I'm going to really select cool. positioning guide and do another printed process. So this is how you'll set it up. Um, you can see that the object type up here is model. You can do these on digital impressions as well. Um, so you just need to make sure that you have the proper object type set up here. And then I'm going to do unsectioned because I have no removable die. So I'm going to go ahead and select scan. And now it's going to take me into the scanning software. 
So I'm going to move my camera so we can see the inside of the scanner a little bit better. Did I just see a microphone boom? You sure did. Professional. Look at right. you. <laughs> I'm going to start calling you Mr. Studio or something. <laughs> So you can see here, I've got my plate with my um, model on there. Um, you can see that the plates have a rounded edge. Um, so you'll want the anterior to face that rounded edge. Um, and then also inside my scanner here, I have a riser. You'll need to make sure that this is in the scanner and that the rounded edge goes to the rounded edge of the riser. So you can see it's got kind of a flat edge here. Um, and then I'll place that. So the anterior of your model should be facing the back of the scanner. Very good. Now, when you were setting up the order form, we set up as a single unit, but you could do this for, let's say if I wanted to do a bridge, right? That, yep. that shouldn't be an issue? Okay. Yep, so there are there are two options in there. You saw virtual temporaries, was, which is what I chose. Um, there's also virtual ponics, and it has to do with the way that the software is going to modify the scan um, so when it modifies for a virtual temporary you're going to get a prep like structure underneath when it modifies for a virtual ponic you're going to get a ponic site underneath gotcha. um, so you can do large span bridges with this if you want uh, so that that's all possible so uh, back here on my screen you can see that it wants me to annotate number six on the margin at the buckle side so this is going to be since these are not prepped, we're going to do somewhere around the gingiva margin. This doesn't have to be exact, but it does need to be on the buckle surface of number six. Um, we can move that around later. And then you can either use your mouse to select the area that you want, or you can come over here to the left and select select all, and that will select everything that shows up. Um, or if you want to clear out your selection, you can hit the clear selection with the red X. And then if you select everything here and then you want to adjust where you've selected, if you click on the minus, you can actually remove some of your selection with the minus tool. Very cool. So I'm going to go ahead and select next now, and it's going to finish out the scan. While we're waiting, uh, we did have one question come in, um, and I'm not sure if... Uh, we're going to touch on this later or not, um, but we have a question that is, uh, is there a way to print a model of the prep teeth? Um, there is no workflow through the software where you can print prep teeth. There are some people that have in the 2020 software found uh, like backdoor techniques to do it, uh, but it is, it is limited. Um, so to do it, you have to have, individual teeth you can't do it with a bridge um, and it has to do with file manipulation and it's it's kind of something that three shape as a company doesn't sell or show but if the resellers want to show uh, they're more than welcome to yeah okay now is there i mean why why is that i mean it seems because that's you know on the reseller side we get that when it comes to to printing or doing you know any digital temporaries and three shape that's like probably the first question we get is well how do i print the model so um, is there is there a specific reason why 3Shape hasn't integrated that yet? Yeah, it has to do with the FDA. Um, basically, if we virtually prep the model and we give that to the customer, we're basically saying that, you know, we're giving them something where we've done basically dentistry, which we're not allowed to do. Um, so while we can make a shell temporary, we're not technically allowed to manufacture the model that goes along with it. Um, so that's why we have the positioning guide in there so that there's no issue seating the temporary. Gotcha. Cool. So it looks like we also had another, uh, just a comment come through as, uh, Vinny from Stony Brook. He just wanted to say hi to everybody and especially say hi to Brandon. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I I'm guessing you and uh, Brandon probably worked a lot together when Brandon's here. What mix? Hi Vinny.
So you can see here our model is post-processing. Basically what's happening is, is um, the when it scans, it takes and uh, basically uses lasers to uh, send a signal down to the surface of the model and it gets a bounce back and that creates a point. Then what it has to do in this post-processing step is take all of those little points, which if I zoom in here, you can see them. Mm -hmm. in the cloud and generate a surface off of those. So it's basically connecting the dots. Boom, science. <laughs> um, another neat trick that you can do, um, since you have the ability to jump through the workflow, um, if you're waiting on a scan to post process, the scanner is not actually working, so you can take the scan out, drop the other object in, come up to your workflow bar, and go ahead and start the scanning process on it so that you can save a little bit of time. Cool. And then while it's scanning, you can jump back and trim up your scan if you need to. Um, you can also, so you can see my annotation here on the uh, buckle surface it asks for it to be at the margin. It's a little bit high, so I can actually left click and grab it and drop it down right at that margin if I need to. Now, what'll happen if you, if you, um, for example, like had it way, you know, much lower on the model or in the wrong position? What, what's, what issues is that going to present later on in the process? So it, it's gonna give you a couple issues. So the first issue is, let's say you put it on the lingual surface instead your tooth, if you choose a library tooth, is gonna come in backwards. So the buccal surface of the library tooth is going to be facing the, the dot that you place. Um, the second issue that can come up is um, if you decide to use the patient's tooth as the, the restoration, the way that the control points are added to that tooth are based on that annotation. So if you have it off to, let's say, the mesial of the buckle, then your control points will be rotated slightly towards that dot. Gotcha. Cool. Makes sense. So again, it, it selects the object. So basically what this, this purpose of this uh, selection is, is that Obviously, a lot of times we don't need all of the information when we scan in a model. A lot of times the scanner will pick up base information and things like that that we just don't need. If you scan everything, it increases your scanning time a little bit. So you can actually trim away the information that you don't need on the scan to shorten the scan time and actually make the file size a little bit smaller, which will increase your loading or decrease your loading times when you're designing. So a couple a couple things I'll show while we're waiting for the scan. Um, not a lot of people know this, but there is a scanner settings box over here on the right um, where you can access any of your options for your scanner. Um, you can turn on and off things like your scan texture, your uh, GPU triangulation, uh, auto start, things like that. Um, another neat little trick to this um, is Let's say you have two computers that are running the scanner um, and you don't, you can't obviously have the scanner hooked up to two separate computers. So if you use the IP address or the local name of the PC up here in the box on the computer that is not connected to it, you can actually remotely connect to the scanner and scan from two separate computers. Cool. So again, we're post-processing here. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull my model out and go ahead and start setting it up for my bite scan. And there's a couple things that you can use to put your bites together. Um, 
depending on how heavy the models are. You can use rubber bands, you can use hot glue and popsicle sticks. Um, in this case, I'm using two 3D printed models, so they're really, really light. So I'm just gonna use some blue tack to hold them together. Now, if you didn't have blue tack, what other options could you use? Uh, probably the easiest is rubber band. Um, you also have, um, there's a jig. Um, so if I go ahead and trim up my skin here and then move to the next step, you can see pictured here on the left of my screen here, there's this bite jig that you can purchase. Um, it is rather expensive though. Um, so it's probably not the most economical, um, option that you can use. Uh, but it is an option. It just basically you put everything in there in the bite, compress the top member down until it kind of holds the top member in place, and then you can scan that way. For me, I'm using blue tack on the inside of my bite to hold my bite in place. Um, but again, these are not stone models, so they are really light. So this will this will hold these just fine. But something else uh, heavier like stone won't hold up. A um, couple other options that you have if you're mounting these on an articulator, um, you do have the articulator holder um, and you also have the uh, articulator transfer plates if you're using an approved articulating system like uh, in a case of Whitmix, they use the Dinar 300 series. What about like a hot glue gun? Yep, hot glue. Um, you could use that hot glue and popsicle sticks if it's more edentulous. Um, but yeah, you have options. Uh, just be careful with hot glue because when it cools, it does uh, contract a little bit. So it can change your bite slightly if you have a lot of edentulous areas. Gotcha. So it could distort. Yep. Um, so you can see here, my bite scan is done. I did have a little bit of the lower cutoff because it is a rather short model. Um, our scanner does have kind of a sweet spot where it expects the arches to be positioned within the scanner. So if you have a, a rather short model, um, you can use some blue tack to kind of prop it up higher in the scan plate and it'll scan, it'll get more information down there. If I go to my alignment results here, you can see that it didn't automatically align. So I'll just have to come in here and manually align. So Starting with the lower, um, it's really simple to align these. So we have these two lower windows here. Um, if you uh, just want to do one point, you can, or if you feel like it's going to be harder to align, you can select three points. So you have those two different options here on the left. So I always start with one point, and I'm just going to click one common point on both the bite scan and my model scan. And then we'll see... So if you get this kind of marbleization um, across the surfaces of the scan here, that means that they probably aligned uh, correctly. So I'm just gonna go to the upper and do the same thing. And I like to use um, areas that are kind of like what I like to call hard transitions. So like right at the gingiva margin, you can definitely see like a line there. If you try to use like the center of the tooth, sometimes that surface is too smooth and it can't figure out the two objects. Um, so always try to use like hard creases, like maybe right here where you can see where the, the tissue kind of transitions into the base. If you've got that information there, that works too. So I've got this marbleization. So I'm gonna click on alignment results and I can come in here and just kind of look around and make sure that you know, I put my bite together properly. Um, if it looks like it's slightly open, maybe you had to use a bite registration in between, you can use this optimize occlusion button here. And what this does is it doesn't just drop it down into occlusion, it kind of equilibrates it. Just like when we take two models separately and use our kind of feel to place those together, it's kind of the same process that it does right here. Um, just be careful using it if you have a lot of edentulous space because again, it doesn't know the difference between tooth structure and tissue on a model and it will try to occlude the tissue together. Makes sense. Makes sense. We, have a, <clears throat> we have a quick question here. 
Um, what are some good scan sprays to use? And is there any kind of inexpensive workaround that I could buy at Walmart or something? So we used to sell a scan spray. Uh, we, I don't think we do any longer. Um, yeah, so you can buy CAD sprays. Um, you can buy various powders. I, I know Snow Rock sells one. Um, it's like a powder that's pretty popular. Um, but to answer your question, if there's any workaround that you get at Walmart, yeah, there is. Um, you can use Tenactin which is like athlete's foot powder spray. Make sure it's powder spray uh, from Walmart. And that will work as well. And it's uh, pretty inexpensive. And one thing I'll highlight on that too is the difference uh, between the CAD spray and the foot spray is actually the nozzle that's used. Um, and some, some like odor ingredients in the foot spray, but so when you spray your models, um, don't spray directly at them uh, because what will happen is, is you'll get areas that get a lot of clumping, um, which will make those surfaces inaccurate. So what I usually do is I um, will go to like a trash can and I'll hold the model below where I'm spraying and let the dust kind of fall as, it, as I spray it. That way you get more of an even coating and you don't put it on too thick. I've also heard of besides the like the foot spray. I've also heard of people using like a uh, like a spot check for welding for like a crack detection. Mm. Um, I've heard that works really well, and it's fairly inexpensive for the quantity you get in the can. So that's something else you can look at and try. I haven't tried it myself, but I've heard it's a um, another alternative to the cat sprays. Yep. We also have a mm -hmm. comment here: um, zirconia dust from the mills works great with a makeup brush. Just brush it on. I've never used that. I would be very careful to make sure that dust doesn't get into the scanner um, because that could probably long term create some serious issues. But yeah, I mean, I, I haven't tried it, actually, but that sounds like it probably work. So when I was at my dad's lab, we actually when we went to our training with CAP, this is uh, seven years ago, eight years ago, went to CAP's training and they actually recommended using zirconia, the zirconia powder or dust. Hmm. At that point in time, yeah, in fact, pretty I'm cool. pretty sure I'm pretty sure my dad still has the same exact jar that we got seven years ago because it lasts so long. Yeah, yeah, that you can use that too. Um, and going back to uh, the putting the dust on there, um, some people kind of confuse the goal of the dust. Um, some people think that they have to make the object turn white or whatever color the dust is to make it scannable. You you need a very, very, very thin layer. It just has to kind of dull the surface a little bit, and then that will make it scannable. So just keep that in mind. You don't need a whole lot. Um, so I'm going to go ahead now. My bite's all aligned. I'm going to go next. And then I get a preview step here. So just in this preview step, you can come in here and kind of 2D cross-section areas. And you can look at your space and your bite and make measurements. So if you want to see what your clearances are, you can do that, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and select design here. It's going to take me into the design software. So I'm going to move this back. When you pull up that design software, um, a question came through. Uh, I believe it was referring to the actual model itself, asking if one side of the model has powder and if the other side does not. Uh, because they, the question is really referring to that the diff, they see a difference in texture quality on one side of the model versus the other. Would you be able to go into, um, I guess, a, I guess a review of why one side of the model, especially where the indication is, looks like it's in greater detail versus the uh, other side? And you'll have to probably put in the, uh, I guess, non-texture view, the monochrome view, to see the difference here. So. Uh, basically what happens is um, with the scanners is you can see here where we've got a lot of surface texture around our our site where we're going to be doing the temporary and that's has to do with the fact that what what our scan software kind of does is it looks at that annotation that we placed on there and it does a, a higher resolution scan of the area where you're you're designing your restoration so um, you can't really tell from the the uh, models that I have here, but they do have a little bit of a texture to them. You can kind of feel it when you run your finger over the surface. Um, you just can't see it as well um, when you just look at it with the naked eye. 
uh, but the scanner picked up on it quite a bit here in this area um, where the rest of the model is a little bit more smooth. And that's just because the rest of the model here does not need as high a detail because it's just gonna be used for byte purposes. Yeah. Um, so uh, here in the software, um, it, it defaults us here to the segmentation step. Um, if you need to go back and make any changes to the scan, um, you can come back here to the uh, prepare step, uh, but I'll, I won't get into that right now. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and look at my segmentation line here. Um, if you don't place your annotation properly, this initial segmentation line, it could be off as well. So you might have to do a lot more editing here, uh, but you can uh, edit this just like a margin. So I can come in here and redraw uh, kind of where I want it to go. You can also click um, in areas and it will kind of snap a little bit to those areas. Um, so you do have a few options here as to um, how you edit this. Um, also, if you right click on it, um, you can go to uncheck the fast edit line and it's gonna give you all these points that you can edit as well. Um, to change the amount of points, if you come into, um, I think it's, actually it doesn't give me the option here. Um, so you, you do have to actually edit each individual point um, if you wanna use this option. And you can see as I'm grabbing a point, it gives me the little 2D cross section there uh, right above it that shows me kind of where I am on the surface. Um, not as handy here, but it is more, uh, more usable when you're doing like an actual die prep um, and marking the margin. Uh, so I'm just gonna go around and check it. Everything looks good here um, on my cutout line. So now I'm gonna go next. And now what it's doing is it's actually segmenting out that tooth. So you can see it kind of cut it out here along this line. Um, and now I'm doing a insertion direction here. So uh, when you have a tooth like this, I always like to look at my contacts to see kind of where a parallel would be along my contacts. So maybe about like right here. And then I'm gonna hit the set button here on the left. That's going to set it to a new path of insertion. Don't so much worry about the red here uh, because obviously that's going to be designed. That's not what we're fitting over. Um, so uh, just go ahead and go next again. And now we can edit our margin. So the margin was originally marked up above the contacts. So we do need to edit it slightly here and bring it down to where the gingiva should be. Um, so you can kind of see the gingiva a little bit here. Um, where it goes into the embrasure space um, on the model. So we can edit these areas and um, you can also edit um, around the whole surface. I would recommend leaving it just because you don't wanna make these sub gingiva, you want them to be above the tissue so that when you go to reline it, the reline material becomes your margin. Um, so we'll go ahead and go next again. And now it's gonna take us into design. Uh, so you can see that it removed the entire tooth there and gave me kind of a ponic start uh, position to start, which is fine. And it also gives me back the original tooth. So if I wanted to use the original tooth, um, you can see I have the ability to shape and size it. I can sculpt on it. I can do anything I want to it. Or I can come here to the smile library and grab a, a, a library tooth. Gotcha. So, for example, let's say if the doctor was pleased with the original dentition, they would say just keep it as is. Or if you actually need to perform some restorative work, then you could actually choose a, uh, uh, I guess, a library to pick from, correct? Correct. A tooth from the library. Cool. Yeah. So if I click on the smile library, uh, one nice thing about this, too, is it does um save your library in the smile library so if you need if you decide that you want to go back to it you just go back into the smile library and choose the original tooth so you can see that the original tooth is here uh, but i can choose other 
um, anatomies instead. So you have all kinds of different options here. So I'll go back to the original tooth and then I can come into the original tooth here and just make some sculpting changes. Um, usually with temps, um, you don't want to give the patient something that's too nice because then they won't ever want to restore the tooth. They'll just want to wear the temporary forever. So good point. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they won't, sure they won't come just, back for the rest of the work. Yeah, just just make sure you make a few changes to it. You know, contours, uh, typically like around the margin area, uh, bulk out some some of that. Don't make too many changes to it because obviously the original position is there now if you have you know a broken tooth maybe use a library tooth at that point or um, you can get creative and sculpt in your own anatomy to the broken area um, filling that in if you want so just going to show a little bit of just sculpting on it you can add in your own line angles and anatomy if you want So just like that. While we're working and on then, that, we had one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Brandon. Go ahead. Um, we had one one question to come in. Hi, possible to do positioning alignment to design temporary? I think maybe what he's referring to is the positioning guide. Uh, and if so, uh, yes, uh, Brandon did select a positioning guide, and I think uh, are we going through the design of that today? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. here too. Um, so once you've got your tooth where you want it, um, if you're redesigning the tooth, you can use the virtual articulator on it to check the function and make sure that, you know, if you've added a library tooth in there, that everything is going to function properly. So I'll just show this, um, real quick, show the movement with the lower arch. So this is in here. It does mark on both the the design tooth and the um, the models, so that you can see not only if it's functioning on the tooth, but you can see if it's actually functioning properly on the models as well. Um, once you've segmented out the tooth, let's say you um, use the library tooth in here, and you wanted to see your position versus the original position. Um, up here at the top right, it does give you your original tooth as a slider option, so you can actually see um, how you fit into the original tooth position, um, so you can use that as a guide um, for the new tooth. Now, that feature is something that was new for 2019, correct? So if anybody has 2019, yeah. they would still have the opportunity to have that slider uh, after virtually extracting the tooth. Yeah, and then the the workaround if you're on something older than 2019 is to just use a pre-op uh, scan and just scan the working model twice. So um, I'm going to go ahead now and go next, and it'll take me to my virtual preparation step. Um, so it brings back up my path of insertion that I chose, um, and it gives me some setup options over here. Um, so you have your transition height. So this is the transition taper from the uh, margin shoulder up to the sides of the prep. Um, so it's not just going to 90 degrees straight up, it's going to taper inward a little bit. Um, so that kind of controls that taper height. Uh, thickness here is the thickness of the shell temporary. Um, you can have that separate from the reduction. Um, so if you if you want it to be you know 0.6 millimeters thick, but you want a larger reduction, you can still do that. Um, and then you have your shoulder radius value here. Remove undercuts is obviously going to remove any undercuts based on the insertion direction. And then you can also use the angle option below here to taper the walls of the prep as they go up. Um, so I'll just kind of preview this to show what it looks like. And then I'll remove. So you can see that that is my prep design there. Um, and then when I turn on my shell temporary slightly, you can see that because I only reduced 
or only made the thickness 0.6, but the reduction was 0.8. I have more space inside. Gotcha. Let's say uh, a material has a requirement of, uh, hypothetically speaking, let's say one millimeter. Uh, how would you preset or where would you change that at? So if you change it here at the thickness, it's only going to change it for this material. If you wanted to change it across the board, you would need it to go into the control panel. Um, and um, it's really simple to set up. You just uh, plug in that material, plug in these values for your different thicknesses and settings in there, um, and then it will set that up as the, the default every time you choose that material. And then we had, so again, if I... oh, we had one question come through that said, um, Will the parameters be the same if the temp is milled or if it's printed? Uh, the answer would be no. You'd want to use the, I guess, the parameters that are determined for the material manufacturer. So uh, PMA is going to have a specific minimum thickness that has to be within, and same with printed materials. There's going to be two separate uh, settings. You need to read the instructions for use uh, according to what it would be. I, I believe for PMA, uh, well, you wouldn't go below six tenths of a millimeter. What would you? What do you guys think? I would say eight tenths of a millimeter for PMMA. Um, eight tenths. Just, okay. Yeah. I, I, I tend to uh, read it. Go ahead, Brandon. I, I was going to say I tend to treat it more like Emacs, um, just okay. because that's a fairly weak material. We have another question. Uh, is there a way to print a reduction guide based on the virtual reduction to verify adequate reduction based on the design restoration? Um, I don't probably you're probably going to run into the same FDA issues as printing the model, I would imagine. Right, Brandon? Yeah, you would. Um, like, uh, again, like I was saying before, there there is a way that you could generate a model off of this. Um, it's not a validated workflow and it's not FDA approved. Um, so it's not something that I can particularly show you, but there are some end users and resellers out there that know how to do it um, that can show you that technique. I will say it has a lot to do with file manipulation within the order form. So it, it, it can be kind of difficult for users that are not as computer savvy to, to work around it. Cool. So you can see here, I made the thickness a millimeter, and when I did a 2D cross section of it, um, it is a little over a millimeter. It's not going to do it exact. It's going to be close to a millimeter, um, just because of the surface of the actual prep itself. So you can see here, it's closer to a millimeter. Um, so once you have your reduction done and I select next, as long as I've set my order form up for a positioning guide, it will take me into the positioning guide design. Um, so this is really simple to do. If you've ever used our bar software, um, it's the same concept where you have a bar that basically sits on top um, and you can manipulate it. So I always like to kind of fade my bar a little bit so I can see through it, so I can e more easily position it to where it intersects my arch um, a little bit better. So, and based on um, results that you get, you can do just the adjacent teeth, or you can take this thing and you can stretch it out to more teeth. To add more angulation points, you just click on the green line and it'll give you a few more control points and then you can manipulate those around as well. So we had another question come through. Um, how much stronger is the best printed temp material available and at what thickness? Um, so the printed temporary materials for FDA clearance I believe the Denka is one of the only uh, temporary FDA approved 510K temp uh, material available. The, I was just looking it up, the flexural strength on it. Um, let's see here. I believe it is equivalent to 50 MPA. So it's not, 
you know, this is just a, a temporary, not a long-term device. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the advantages of having a temporary versus milled restoration is the amount of time it's going to take to mill it versus 3D printing it. So you have to, I mean, a milled temporary and a printed temporary, the milled temporary is always going to be stronger. Uh, PMA is just an extremely dense, very hard material. The printed material from Denka is really hard as well, but it's not going to be like a milled uh, restoration. Uh, but you have to remember the wear and tear on your machine that you have with milling PMA, and then beyond that, how much faster you can 3D print it. And we'll be able to demonstrate that on Wednesday when I actually 3D print the temporaries. I think uh, the uh, I think the DTAX free print temporary resin, if it's not approved yet, I think it's going to be pretty soon. Cool. Uh, on the Asiga Max. Cool. I can look that up real quick as well. To see uh, what they let's have. see here's while you're doing that uh, for bigger cases can we pos can we position the position guide on the pallet uh, or floor of the mouth for full arch cases I don't see why not um, Brandon what would you say to that yeah I, I can actually show you that here so if I stretch this little posterior segment out and then just take and pull it all the way down Whatever, whatever I intersect the model with with this, it's going to cut it to the, the model itself. So if I bring this way out here and then just intersect the bottom, it's going to cut it to the pallet. So I just have to make sure that I stretch it in there um, to get it positioned onto the pallet. So yeah, you can. Cool. And then uh, does the position guide print or mill separately or together with the shells? Uh, that's gonna be separate. Yeah, it's going to be two separate STLs. Now, if it's two separate STLs, that means we have to do two separate print jobs. Uh, obviously, the temporary, we're going to print out of the temporary material, but what, what type of material would you guys recommend printing that positioning jig out of? I would just say some kind of cheap PMMA. It's not a long-term device. Um, so you could use surgical guide material. You could use some kind of printable PMMA. If your temporary material is cheap, then just print it in your temp material. Um, that way you can run it all in one build. I would say probably surgical guide resin is going to be, I think, the the optimal. A, because it is it is you know considered by the FDA as a class one or three. Class this one is a medical device. Surgical guides are class one because it's an accessory to a medical device. Right. So it is indicated for intraoral use, just not long term. So it can go in the mouth safely. Whereas like a model resin, for example, you wouldn't want to print in a model resin because that is not indicated to uh, for any kind of intraoral use. Um, and I think probably surgical guide is going to be a better option than split than like a splint resin because it's going to be cheaper because splints are considered class two medical devices. And with that comes much more expensive um, development. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I would say probably surgical guide is going to be the sweet spot. Cool. Um, we had another question come through. It says, I'm sorry, I missed how you, um, how did you create the positioning guide itself? Uh, now, if you, this, the positioning guide enabling to be able to design it is stemmed all the way back to the original order form when Brandon set up. Uh, his order, so he added the positioning guide at that point, and then the actual application and design of it is simply it automatically defaults and adds a bar on, and then he custom tuned it to that. Um, yep. So you can see here, I've kind of got my guide positioned um, where I want it um, over here on the left. Um, so we've got some settings. So we've got uh, remove undercuts. So you can see that based on the position of some of where I've placed this, it's going to engage some undercuts. So I need to make sure that I check off remove undercuts so that it doesn't engage into those and make it to where we can't uh, draw it off. Now, if you're using a flexible material for the positioning guide, let's say you decided to use like an IVT material, um, then you could probably engage those undercuts and be fine. Um, Show undercuts is going to show the undercuts on the model based on the path of insertion. Um, so you can see right below that, I can set an insertion direction here. So if I look at my model again from the top down and hit the 
set button there, it's going, going to change where those undercuts show up. Um, so as long as you uh, either don't engage the undercuts here, so if I lift this up above, or if you just check remove undercuts, either way, it's going to make it to where it fits. And then down below that, you have space to scan and design distance. So that's going to be like a little spacer inside so that you have a little play to where it doesn't uh, lock onto the model a little bit. Below that, you'll have drill compensation. If if I had chosen like zirconia or something like that for the positioning guide material, I would have my drill compensation and then I would be able to enter in my drill radius and things like that there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead now and go next. And it's going to take me to the sculpt step. How about that's loading the default uh, insertion direction for that for the placement jig? Is that just defaulted upon the original uh, design of your uh, temporary? Yeah, it's going to use the the default position for the temporary. Um, so while that might work for the temporary, the overall model might have a different path of insertion, so we might need to change it up a little bit. So basically what it's doing going from positioning guide to sculpt is it's actually cutting the whole intaglio surface of that positioning guide to fit to the model. So we'll be able to see that when we go into the next step. So sometimes this can take a little bit of time, similar to the amount of time if you've used our denture software, where when you cut the pockets in to the denture base, it does take a, a little bit of time to do that as well. Um, so usually this will sit for a few seconds. Uh, we did have one question. Where can we get the classification information for all materials uh, from the manufacturer? That's the person to ask. So. Um, I can tell you when it comes to our Whitmix resins, um, the surgical guide resin is a class one medical device resin, uh, and the, the Veris, our Verisplint resin is a class two medical device resin. Then we got another question that says, can I open a screw hole to the guide? Um, yes, um, the answer, I mean, if you want to cover it, Brandon, yeah, I mean, there there are two ways that you could use the positioning guide. Um, if you're doing a temporary and you're doing it over an existing implant site, um, if you scan it in using the uh, the actual DMEs, maybe scanning this in as like a screw retain case, um, it will automatically put the screw access hole in there for you. However, if you've not, then it's not going to put it in there you can use the attachments tool in the sculpt step that we're going into um, and align it and then put your own access hole into it if you if you want to go that route too um, so yes it will um, you can use the positioning guide for a lot of different indications as well uh, is the positioning guide available on other crown and bridge cases um, Brandon, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think isn't the position positioning guide available for temporaries, custom abutments? Um, aren't there two more things that you can use a positioning guide for that the software um, will allow? Yeah, you can use it for um, some crown and bridge indications. Um, you can use it for anything within the custom abutment area um, or implant area. Um, it will work for, um, I, think, I think it's just crown and bridge indications and implants at the moment. Okay. Um, I can't I think of anything just, else off the top of my head that it works for. I thought it was just veneers under the crown and bridge. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking too. All right, Brandon, I have a question. Like... Go ahead. What are the specifications of your computer? <laughs> um, I'm, just being, I'm just being a smart aleck. <laughs> so we have a minimum requirement for our computers. Um, apparently mine's frozen up. Uh, 
it so mine mine is plenty capable of running this um but i am running a beta version so there are sometimes unforeseen bugs within the beta um so let me uh let me jump out of this and go back into it um the the requirements for the pcs you have to have an at least an i7 processor um you have to have at least uh 16 gig of ram um and then you also have to have a uh the minimum the absolute bare minimum requirement for the graphics card is at least a nvidia gtx 1050 ti um i would definitely go above that if you're going to be designing anything that's um, on the larger side um like full arch cases uh with dentures or or screw retained uh like bars and bridges and things like that um, and full mouth reconstructions for Crown and Bridge definitely go above that. But if you're just doing simple single unit stuff, uh, the default minimums are are fine. Yeah. So we're you know you kind of touched on that this is the beta version from Three Shape, and I know in in years past, uh, Three Shape when they came out with new releases, it um, it always felt like it was a little more well, not to say rush to market, but kind of a rush. In the last two years, it seems like Three Shape has really emphasized more energy on getting it right. You know, do yes. you feel do you feel that Three Shape has really stepped up their game in validating? And I know there's a couple of user groups, or you know, they use a bunch of KOLs now for beta testing their their 2020 software. Do you think when it's actually officially released, do you think that there's even a need for the reseller to still go through and do their own internal testing, or do you think it three shape has it to a point down to a science that it's it's almost rock solid ready to go? Um, I still emphasize when the first release comes out to test it. Um, there are some things. So basically, what happens when we beta test is we have internal three shape personnel that test it out. We also send it out to our beta resellers and and laboratories. Now, the problem is, is that they test it based on things that they do. So if we send it out to a lab who only does crown and bridge applications, they're only going to test crown and bridge. We send yeah. it out to a denture lab, they're only going to test dentures. So we still need people to test it even after the first release, because when we release it into the general population, we'll find things that we didn't realize were an issue that become an issue because we didn't have an end user who tested it during the beta. Right. So um, there's always that issue. And then the other issue you have to watch out for is if you're doing anything with implants, you have to make sure that whatever companies you're sending to, especially when you go from like 19 to 20, that those implant companies have validated their DMEs for the new version. Uh, because what will happen is you'll upgrade and then no implant companies have validated and then they won't accept your files. Um, so just keep in touch with your implant reset or your implant providers and make sure that they've validated before you do your update. So it let me go ahead now um, to the sculpt step. So uh, going back to that question, if I needed an, a hole in this, if I was doing maybe a screw mentable, um, I do have the attachments option here, and then I can go to holes um, and go to whatever size hole I want and place that in the site that I need, and then I can cut that out of the um, the positioning guide. Now, if you if this was actually gone through the screw retained workflow, it would automatically place that hole for us, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that would that would already be there if we were doing a, an implant case. Gotcha. So here um, I can do some sculpting. I can smooth some things up if I want. Uh, just cleaning up the overall surface. You can also see that it has now cut to my model. Um, so you can see back here, it does have some tissue contour on it. So this will rest on the tissue as well so if you have a, a case where you're maybe doing a full arch you can still put this down onto the tissue and get it to seat 
Um, you can also see that it's cut to um, the crown that we designed, so it will the crown design will fit up in there as well. Very cool. Uh, so from here, we'll go next, and now it's going to give me um, my ID tag. Um, so you can use this or you cannot use this. Um, one of the things that's nice about this is um, before it used to be that you would do um, this before you would do the sculpt step and then you would have to watch where you placed your text. <laughs> if you ran over it with a smooth tool, it would kind of wipe it out. Um, kind of a nice change. <laughs> yeah. So I can come in here and position this around on the surface to where I want it. If I want a different text size, um, I can come here to font height and I can increase my text size. Um, then if I go to text depth, it works similar to Model Builder where if you put a negative value in there, it's going to inscribe it into the positioning guide. If you put a positive value there, it's going to have raised text off of the surface of the positioning guide. Very cool. Then from here, I can go ahead and select next. And now it's going to take me to the end where I can go ahead and save it and close out. That wasn't so painful. No. I think easy peasy. I, yeah, I think the temporary workflow is, is intimidating to people at first because it is different than the traditional crown and bridge workflow that they're brought in and trained on. But I yeah. mean, it is fairly straightforward once you do it a couple times. Yeah, and there there are actually two workflows that are built into the software that you can do. Um, this is the, the route you'll go if you're not producing a model. Uh, but if you wanted to produce a model, you would not do the positioning guide. You would instead add it as a uh, model. It would take you into Model Builder and allow you to append the design to the model um, and then produce a model of that where you would do a suck down afterwards. Now, is that um, new? That, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that that appending is new to Model Builder in 2020. Okay. Um, so you, you have a lot of neat new options there. Very cool. So I'm going to close out of the case here and then just show the STLs um, for the case. So you can see my virtual temporaries. I'm going to go to advanced and go to explore cam. Now, on generating the cam automatically, you have to have your dongle number as the manufacturer of that process for it to automatically generate the STL. If you have anything else in there, then it's not going to automatically do it. You'll have to come in here and generate the cam output first and then go to explore cam. So here I've got um, my folder with the different files in it. Um, you've got your STL file of the positioning guide and the uh, the temp. So I'm going to open these up. So here's my positioning guide. Nice. And then I'm going to go ahead and open up both the PTS file and the STL file to show what those are. Um, so if I hide this, you can see um, here that I've got a margin line file that it produces for me along with the virtual temporary. So um, cool. you can you could still take this into a milling uh, system as well. Awesome. So the, PT, the PTS file would then be used for defining the margin in the CAM software for milling. Yeah. The PTS file is not used in the 3D printing software, so it's not necessary. Correct. Uh, we have a, a couple more minutes, so if you guys have any more questions, please throw them on down the pipeline. Uh, while that is, uh, while people are still putting in questions, we did get a couple more. Uh, one of them is, what is the best work from home software to remote into a PC and still be able to design from home? Um, so we actually have been uh, kind of testing out a new kind of course that we're offering. It's called um, Virtual Classrooms. Um, so we use two pieces of software to do these. Um, the main one for designing remotely that we use is called AnyDesk. Now, it does have a subscription fee that you have to pay for it, but what we've found that if you have a decent internet connection, 
that the uh, lag time is is almost non-existent. Um, so it's not like Team Viewer where every time you move your your scans around or your design around, it kind of freezes up and then does it a couple seconds later. This seems to be pretty seamless. Um, I've done a, a virtual classroom course where I've demoed on mine and connected to all six participants that were in the course through AnyDesk. And then the participants, so we had AnyDesk installed on our remote computers in New Jersey, um, and they used AnyDesk to connect to those, and so did I. So I could see what they were doing. They could see my screen using Zoom, and I could we could communicate with each other using Zoom. So um, that's that's a program I would recommend. Is the first time I've used it, and it, it, it is really nice. That's pretty cool. And that's called AnyDesk. Correct. I, yeah, I saw another question word. came through. It said, what was the name of the software? And if you, I believe if you go to anydesk.com, you can see the pricing structure on there and also find out more about the software yeah. itself. This, this is actually what the software looks like here. Um, bring it over. So um, anytime it's installed, you can see that it's got a remote ID that it assigns. Um, if you don't set it up for unattended access, then someone has to be there to allow you access. If you have an, a, an access password, then you just type that password in, just like with TeamViewer, and you can get onto that computer and control it. Hmm. Sounds good. And then from, um, from there, we had another question that says, I'm looking to purchase one of your printers. What are the primary differences between your printers? Uh, so yeah, uh, you'd be referring between the Vera build and the Asiga Max. Uh, Bryce, if you want to go ahead and tackle that. Yeah, um, <clears throat> quite a lot of differences, really. Um, uh, you, the way you get from point A to point B is pretty similar, but, it, but um, there's a lot of differences between these. So the Vera build, uh, the biggest difference is going to be price point. So the Vera build is priced at, I, I believe, 3,500, uh, and the Asiga Max comes in just under 11,000. Now you're probably asking why is there such a big price difference? Uh, the reason is the technology. So the Vera build uses LCD technology. So essentially, if you if you imagine your phone screen, uh, that's kind of how the printer functions. So there's essentially a, a phone screen, or if you will, an, an LCD mask with a UV LED array underneath of it um, that exposes each layer and uh, cures the, the resin. Um, the Asiga, on the other hand, uses, uh, it, it's, a DL, it's a DLP printer. So it uses a, a projector, a UV projector, rather than like a phone screen. Um, so the, the advantage of the, of the Vera build or the LCD printer is the price. It's much cheaper technology. It's been around a lot longer. Um, and uh, you actually uh, you actually may get better accuracy on an LCD printer because you can get the pixels smaller because you're not limited, uh, you're not restricted by the projector, which the pixel size is going to be determined by a the resolution of the projector itself and where it's positioned in regards to the actual build area. Um, the advantage of uh, of the the Asiga Max, uh, the the DLP printer, uh, it, uh, it it has a larger build plate uh, than the Vera build. Uh, and it is much, much faster. Uh, it, it can be as, as much as three times faster uh, or more than the Vera build. Um, yeah. so, so the Vera build is, um, yeah, I don't like to say it's an entry level printer because it, it, it may be an entry level price for a printer, but in terms of performance, these things are little workhorses. I've got one actually right back here on my, on my desk at my house. And um, these things, these things are great little printers. Uh, I, I, I very, very rarely have any kind of failure, and if I do, it's usually my fault. This is true of the Asiga Max as well. Uh, but for 3,500 bucks, it's a great little unit, um, and it's a good way to to kind of learn um, about 3D printing. Uh, the Asiga Max is my favorite 3D printer of all time, uh, be simply because the the price for uh, the price for uh, price to performance ratio. Um, it's just under $11,000, and the amount of performance that you get out of that thing is unreal. Uh, it, it's so fast, it's so accurate, and it's so uh, it's so hassle-free. There's so, there's so little maintenance on them. Um, so so yeah, I mean, quite a few key differences there, um, but both are excellent units. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, if I think if you the question is, is where do you see yourself in a year or two years in the dental lab? If you see yourself ramping up production even even uh, more than what you are today, I would you know it's worth the investment to take the plunge for the Asiga Max. It is a phenomenal printer. Um, if you feel that you're going to be staying stagnant, you know you can't get any busier than what you are today, or you don't you know plan on any seeing any future growth. The Verbuild works great, you know, but it's uh, it's one that you may end up outgrowing eventually. Um, especially when you have the uh, the opportunity to bring on new indication styles. The uh, the other thing, the main difference between the the three or the the Max and the Verabilt is the Max does have a wider range of materials you can use as well. Um, so there is an advantage to that. Uh, we had another question that came through. Um, that what is oh, where did it go? Uh, oh, off subject. Can you place an ID tag on dentures? Uh, the answer is no, not in the software, not in three shape. Uh, you know, it's a great idea, and I think it's something that they should implement because in some states they require an ID tag of some sort for the denture itself. Uh, with that idea, you can send an email to idea at threeshape.com, which I believe goes to the developers. Brandon, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. Or it goes to a team there that would help uh, potentially implement that idea in the future, or they can look at it at least. Yeah, um, there is there is a workaround um, that you can use um, if you're on a computer that has Windows 10. There's a piece of free software on there called 3D Builder. Just import your STL in there, uh, emboss the name on the internal or the uh, the palette area or you know wherever you want on it, and then just regenerate the STL with the the ID tag in there. It cool. it's adds an extra maybe minute of time to designing it, but it's pretty seamless. Cool. Uh, we got two more questions. How much is the Sega Pro 4K? It is $24,990. Um, but it is also heck, three heck times the size. Yeah. Heck of a deal. <laughs> is the Sega 4K able to use third-party resins? You betcha. There's over 350 validated resins for the uh, Sega Pro 4K and counting. Bam! Yeah, mm. so that's um, it's a uh, pretty remarkable. Um, there's really, literally no resin out there that you can't use on it. It's just a matter of the people being able to sell it to you. So, for example, a common question we get is, can I use that Lucitone 3D print resin on the Asica Max or one of the Asica printers? The answer is technically yes, you can use it because it is the same wavelength and it uh, you can print it. It's just a matter of getting your hands on it. Uh, and you would be stepping outside of the FDA 510K, but it's your own risk. Um, another question we got is, in the three-shape remote scan from a second computer, is that only available on version 2020? So I, I believe that was pointing the directory over, Brandon, if you want to go ahead and explain that. No, that, that actually sh has been available since Scan at Dental came out, um, which was back in 2015. Um, so you should have access to it now if you're on even the last three, four years worth of software. Um, it's just an extra option that nobody really knew what it did, uh, but that's kind of what it does. Very cool. Well, that looks like it's all the questions at this point in time. Brandon, we cannot thank you enough for what you did today. Uh, I believe you will be joining us on Wednesday and Friday as well. Yep. Very good. So Brandon will be able to heckle me and Bryce this time around. And uh, uh, once again, thank you all that have joined on. Remember, Wednesday is uh, we're going to be talking about the 3D printing aspect of it. So we'll be looking at the Verbuild and the Asiga Max and looking at both of those nesting softwares and uh, printing them. And then on Friday, we'll be talking about post-processing the prints and cleaning it and curing it and Maybe doing a little bit of finishing work as well. See if uh, the time allows it. Um, we did have one more question that came in. Do these printers come with their own computer or is that optional? The answer is no. They do it's not come no. with a computer. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard no. So the computers, I mean, we can sell the computer with it. However, the requirements to run that software is extremely low. Um, you can use your three shape software. It's not going to be taxing on your three shape, or sorry, three shape computer. You can use that computer, and it's not going to be taxing enough on it. So, um, 
I mean, I have a, a simple laptop at home that I uploaded the software on and it works just fine. And it's not even close to being anything performance wise. But good question. Um, thank you again for your time today. Remember, this is a recorded webinar. You can watch it again later. Uh, there will be the CE questions coming through. Uh, my name is Corey with Whitmix Corporation. Thank you so much for your time. I'll let you guys do your own outro. Bryce, thanks for joining. Uh, looking forward to seeing everybody hopefully on Wednesday. And yeah, I'll talk to you then. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah.